welcome back to another episode of Behind the Gate with Scott and Kate podcast. We're delighted to have you rejoin us on a journey deeper into the harness racing industry. Whether, whether you're a returning fan or a newcomer, we are excited to explore the sport. We have so much in stock for you guys, so sit back, enjoy, and let's dive in. Scott, I'll hand it over to you now to introduce our wonderful guest speaker. Yes, thanks very much, Caitlin. Glad to be here again. It's our third episode of uh, Behind the Gate with Scott and Kate, sponsored by Advanced Appetite, and uh, very pleased to have on hand, I've been waiting to talk to this guy for a while, um, Paul Langell. He's at a Truro Raceway, and uh, he's got 462 lifetime wins, and I'm not sure if he even, well, he probably does, but he just went over a million dollars in earnings this past year by like about five thousand dollars. So congratulations, Paul! Thank you. And Thank you. On, on the training side, uh, Paul's been uh, been outstanding. Two hundred forty-one wins, over six hundred ninety thousand earned, and just in twenty twenty-three alone, he earned over two uh, two hundred thousand dollars. So. Uh, Welcome, Paul. Uh, glad for you to join us. And uh, like I say, we've been waiting to get you on here for a little while. And uh, how's your winter going so far? Oh, pretty good. It's been long. and I always find the month of March to be long. You always get mud and rain and yeah. dirt. But once we get through this month, it should be you get forward to looking forward to racing. So it's coming. Yeah, we were talking about that off camera, and it was kind of nice this weekend to see Mark Campbell in action down in uh, Saratoga and get some maritime news going again as far as racing. So it was a big weekend, actually, for a number of maritimers. Dale Spence, who you know very well, won a couple races on the weekend on the big circuit of Mohawk. And Katie McNeil, I guess she's originally from uh, has family in Cape Breton. She had a big uh, weekend as well. And uh, just a big weekend for Maritimers. Uh, Monica Sutherland, of course, was a big part of the International Women's Day at uh, the Meadowlands on the weekend. So I wanted to dive into it right now though, Paul. And again, thanks for joining us. And um, I wanted to find out, I know at the start of your career that you learned not <laughs> probably one of the best horsemen we've seen in Atlantic Canada. And I always had a ton of respect for uh, this gentleman, Phil Pinckney. But uh, I wonder if you could tell our listeners just a little bit more about how you came to be part of Phil's operation at an early age. Yeah, I would say I was very fortunate to fall into that place for sure. It's made a big difference in where I am today. But yeah, when I was young and we used I used to go with my grandfather to the races and we'd be in the grandstand I'd be picking tickets or whatever and just fell in love with it that way but then he used to hang out at Phil's barn so I went down with him one day and I liked that side better than <laughs> the watching the races from the grandstand and then after that we used to just go after school or on the weekends me and Ben Hollingsworth was there a lot and yeah just started that way and like I said, very lucky that's where I started for sure. Yeah, and Ben Hollingsworth, he's had a pretty good uh, go of it at uh, Mohawk. He's worked uh, worked his way up in that circuit. So Yeah, he uh, does very good for the numbers he has. Yeah, and he gets Dale Spence to drive uh, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it's nice to too, see. So. Yeah, so that's really nice to see. Caitlin, I think you get the next question for uh, Mr. Langell. Perfect. Um, what were some of the biggest things that you learned from Phil that made you the horseman that you are today? <laughs> There's definitely a lot, most of what I know. But no, he was, uh, you had to pay attention with him because he wouldn't come right out and tell you what to do. But I mean, I remember if I was training horses and he'd say, well, maybe you should let the hobbles out. Well, maybe not. But I mean, deep down, you knew you should let the hobbles out. <laughs> He kind of just hint around at things you should do. So, I mean, you had to pay attention. But Now, his horse has always looked top shape. And I'd say as crazy as it sounds, one of the biggest takeaways I'd take from him is how well he fed. 
And I mean, his horses were always fat. And I think nowadays they go so fast and for so long, they got to be in top shape when you start because the year's so hard on them. And if they're not in top shape when you start, by the time you're finished, you'll have nothing left. So I think that's probably the biggest thing. I mean, there's lots I could go on and on this whole time, but what he taught me, but that's just kind of an outside the box one. Yeah, that's awesome. And Phil, of course, uh, well known for his uh, his prowess with the, the young horses, Paul. And uh, I know that uh, you've got a number of horses coming up, uh, both uh, two-year-olds and three-year-olds. And we'll talk about uh, malignity here in a little bit. But uh, just tell us a little bit about uh, some of the two-year-olds that you have. I see you've got a, a pink shui filly named uh, Gretchen. How is she coming along so far? Yeah, they're all pretty good so far. I mean, I'm, they've all trained a couple times. They, they're like everyone else's. They have good days. They have bad days right now. I mean, I trained half the other day. Half were good and half were poor, and I'm sure the next time they'll be reversed. I don't really get caught up in this time of year and how good they are. I mean, you like to see some traits like attitudes this time of year. If, I mean, if they're wanting to go by now, they're probably going to be all right. Yeah. But I, I can go through the ones I have. I got... We bought Gretchen as a weanling along with Malignity's full brother. His name's Malevolent. He's a malicious yeah. cult. Yeah. So we bought them as weanlings, and they were raised out home here. And we bought two in Harrisburg, a betting line cult. And Arnold Hagen bought a tall, dark stranger filly. And in the island sale, we bought a bet the moon filly and a Stonebridge Terror cult. So that's, oh. I have six. But they're all in where they should be right now i think i mean yeah i don't get too high on them this time of year or, or too low <laughs> yeah it's a little early i guess yeah it is yeah. i mean you really i've seen them go both ways you train them down good and you get behind the gate and whoops i overvalued this one so i mean until you <laughs> race a couple times yeah i don't know just the way i do things i don't tell the owners much until they get down <laughs> No, exactly. So I, I got to ask, you've got a full brother to uh, malignity. Uh, any um, thing to remind you of his older brother? Does he get the same mannerisms or build or? Uh, it's really an unfair comparison. We should be looking yeah, at him as his own self. But no, no, it's for a full brother to him. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. That's yeah, he's a big Big cold. I mean, Malignity was a big cold. He grew a lot when he was two, but this, I think yeah. at this stage, this guy's probably bigger than him, but I don't think okay. he'll end up bigger. I think he'll probably stop growing quicker than Malignity did, but he's yeah. a good gator cold. He likes to go. And I mean, hopefully from now until July, we have some luck to get him there. Awesome. What about the uh, betting line? Uh, I see the betting lines doing fairly well right across North America. Uh, what do you think of him so far? I guess it's Shill Hanover is his name. Yeah, yeah, he's a nice mover. Even the day that we broke him, he nice trot and gait to him. And he's a good mover, good attitude to go. Yeah, I mean, he's where he should be. Oh, good, good. So we got to ask you about Malignity. Of course, he's uh, had quite a career so far, Paul, with uh, – He's got uh, 20 wins in uh, his two seasons of racing here in the Maritimes, over $167,000 made, and a record taken over uh, Charlottetown, 153 and one. Just an incredible, incredible trip. And, um, you know, there's been some rumors going around, Paul, that uh, you guys might have been offered a little bit of money for this horse, but just wanted to talk to you about. Uh, how he's coming along, training back, and uh, what you see his role as far as uh, racing in the Maritimes coming up. I actually just trained him for the first time yesterday, so he's just starting his way okay. back. But he's definitely past ready to start training. He's feeling good, and he's yeah. he likes his job, so he likes work, and he's going to start going now. But, no, he seems good. He like I said earlier, I mean, it's such a hard year at three. You race him so much. You truck them all the time. He definitely lost some weight at three. And I think he's bulking back up now. I mean, he looks good that way. But it's a hard year on them. I mean, people don't realize how hard it is to go from, say, July to October. I mean, it's it's hard on them to keep them at top shape. 
I feel like at two, he kind of fell off a little in the middle of the year after old home week, but we were lucky. There was two starts back to back in Cape Breton and they agreed to miss one of them. And the next week it was rained out. So he kind of had like three weeks off and he bounced back really good after that. He win the Breeders' Crown and the Maritime Breeders. And well, he set his record at two in the Maritime Breeders last start of the year. So, I mean, he was fresh then. <laughs> But yeah. at three, I mean, you don't get that break. After Old Home Week, I felt again like he was getting a little tired. But, I mean, there was no breaks in the schedule. So he had to toughen it out. And he did. But, I mean, it took the toll on him for sure. But I think he'll rebound good. Yeah. What do you uh, – any predictions how the horse would do on uh, on a big track? I think a big track would help him. He's a big horse. He's a big, powerful, gated horse. Yeah. But sure he also is. gets around – I mean – he went big trips in Inverness. I mean, them small tracks don't hurt him any, or it doesn't appear to, but I, he definitely go, he likes speed. I mean, it just worked out that he spent most of his time on the front because when you're betting favorite as much as he was, yeah. I mean, put him on the front where there's less runners in front of you or whatever. I mean, it just takes less the risk trouble. out of it. But yeah. I think like if he was following and say a 122 pace, I mean, it would do him better for sure. But no, I think, um, we're probably hoping that he races invitational, but I'm not going to say it'll be in July or August. I don't know. We're going to ease him back in, I think. And hopefully, he'll let us race a couple times in Truro to get his confidence back up. And the difference between three-year-old and four-year-old racing is huge. I mean, like I said, we just yeah. went to the front, and you pretty well got your own way at three, right? Because he had all yeah. the respect. But at four, I mean, if I put him on front and have – B to B on my back or roll him first up. It's a complete different ball game. So, I mean, he's going to have to adjust his racing style, but I think he can. He's He's got so much speed. So, I mean, as long as I can harness that somewhere else in the mile, I think he'll be fine. And what about batter up Hanover? You're going to keep him for the uh, circuit this year as well? Yeah, hopefully he's back going. He's back jogging every day. And yeah, hopefully he's good enough. I mean, every year it gets tougher. 53 was good enough for a couple of years ago and last year i mean he paced a lot of miles 52 and 53 and most time didn't get anything i mean it's hard so hopefully one of them steps up but it's tough going i mean even the overnight race and everywhere is tough now so yeah all right caitlin i think you've got the next question up for paul yeah um as far as drivers um, who would you say the top two or three that you look up to um, would kind of be? Yeah, uh, there's, I'd say like the last five years when so many better drivers around here and guys step up. I mean, on the island, especially there's 10 guys over there that can win every given race. And I, yeah. and I mean, there's no different. New Brunswick has a handful and there's always a handful here, but the island seems to be tough. I mean, there's guys like, say, Kenny Murphy had a career year last year. He started yeah. getting the opportunities, the drives, and he put the wins together. I mean, that's what it takes, right? It doesn't matter who it is. If you don't have the stock, you're going to be <laughs> behind. Yeah. yeah. But uh, to answer your question, I don't know. I remember years ago going with Phil, racing with him, and it always seemed like the biggest competition back then was Jill Barrio. I mean, it seemed, yeah. I remember having battles in the Breeders' Crown with him. He was beating us and whatever. <laughs> yeah. That's just years ago. But there's so many good guys around here. I mean, I drove in the Regional Drivers' Championship last year with all yeah. the good guys. I mean, that was a lot of fun. So yeah. any one of them could have win with the right stock. So, yeah, there's a lot of good guys. I don't know if I could name one or two for sure. but Yeah. Yeah, we'll probably see you again there this year, hopefully, for the regionals. Hopefully. So, yeah. And um, kind of segues into the next question. Uh, of course, everybody knows that, uh, unfortunately, Truro closed a little bit early in 2023 and uh, gave you a chance to uh, kind of pick up and uh, do some more racing than you've already been doing or you already were doing over in uh red shores uh tell us about that experience and if you've ever kind of thought of maybe making a move someday over there 
Yeah, we decided well, they had a couple days at the end of the year, so we kept our horses up. We raced in Summerside till they shut down. Summerside's a nice little drive from here. It's only a couple it hours, is, yeah. so it's a lot closer and seems to be a touch easier, maybe. Don't tell anyone that. Keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. My horses seemed to fit right when they were there, and they did okay. So, but yeah, I mean, it's not ideal, that's for sure. As to moving, I mean, we haven't really... Until we have to, I don't think we would. It's not something that we're thinking of right now. I mean, yeah. we're all, we both got family here and everything's here. So, I mean, as long as it works, we'll try and make it work here for sure. But yeah. six months on and six months off a race and isn't really sustainable. I mean, you can't oh. have a racehorse and be staying in the barn for six months. It's just not, it's not possible. Yeah. So hopefully something gets figured out on that because you're just going to see the horse population go down and down, that's for sure. Yeah, how yeah. is the population, Paul, compared to, uh, say, last year down in Truro? Uh, I think it's okay. I mean, there's a lot of yeah. two-year-olds around. There, I know there were some people who got rid of their race horses and bought younger horses. But like I said, I mean, we were off so early last year, it's hard to keep a horse until June or May, end of May, I guess, but... Yeah, the price of everything's gone up, feed and bedding or whatever. So I mean, if they're standing in the stall for six months, <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Caitlin, you got a question on uh, some ownership opportunities. Yeah. Um, what's your opinion on the fractional ownership? Because you know we know that you were um, a hubtown um, trainer one year and you kept well did and you kept the fractional ownership kind of thing going so what is your you know thoughts on fractional ownership i think it's great for the industry for sure i mean when we raced well did there was lots of people around watching them <laughs> the winter circles when him and the one george had large on lachlan was it when yeah. she win and or well did win, the winter circle be full. And I mean, it was the same last year for little tags. And so, I mean, it's good to get people to the racetrack that way. And I think people get intimidated of owning a hundred percent of a horse. Say. So it's kind of a good stepping stone to getting in a little bigger. And I mean, you kind of figure out what it's all about. And I've seen it work. I mean, there's a couple owners that own well did Helen Landry and her mother they own well did and they they bought yearlings with me so i mean it works that way too so i mean it is it's something the industry needs because of the prices of everything now i mean people want small percentages right so it gets people to the track and keeps people interested or so i think yeah. it's good for the industry yeah and i think uh, like you say paul it's an, affor an affordable alternative to uh owning a full one especially the uh unfortunately in the uh in the economy that we live in and i found like a lot of people whether they own one percent or own 80 percent they're going to the grandstand saying that's my horse they they just like being part of it so it's kind of cool yeah. to see and yeah. i think there's a lot of it a lot more of it nowadays than there used to be but probably why right on so have you set any goals for this coming up or this uh, upcoming season i know you were uh, close to 50 wins this year and um you're looking to have you know productive back-to-back -back seasons like you've been having ha or having and uh your driving average has been uh, uh really good over the last well it's been good for a number of years but especially the last two or three paul so have you set any kind of personal goals going into uh 2024 no, I don't really pay a whole lot of attention to the numbers. I mean, obviously, you see your UDRS or training average on the program, but I don't pay much attention to money. But I just look at the individual horses. I mean, you want to do what's best for every individual horse you got in the barn. So, I mean, I I felt like we had a decent year last year, but I look at a couple in the barn and I thought, well, they should have been a little better. So, I mean, I feel like you can always get a little better. I mean, I feel I we take pride in the ones we have for sure. So I, the training average is priority to me. I mean, we put a lot of work in. I got a great staff with me and without them, it's certainly not possible. So it's a kind of a team effort more than just me for sure. 
But as the awesome. goals, I wouldn't say now I don't pay much attention. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, you've driven at pretty much all the American time racetracks uh, over the past uh, few years. Any up and coming younger drivers that you see that are really uh, starting to pick it up a little bit since uh, maybe they first started? Yeah, it's something we certainly need more of. There's not enough of us young guys out there, so it'd be nice to get some more, but there's there's quite a few around. There's like Mullins and in Inverness does a good job, and Brady Sweet's had a big year. And, I mean, there's a few on the island. Names escape me right now, but there's... Yeah, Brett Clough. It's and... something that... Yeah, Brett Clough and them, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's lots more over there, but... There's some everywhere, yeah. that's for sure. But it'd be nice to get more. I know in Truro, there's only a handful. Keith Legg's one. Yeah. But, I mean, there hasn't been many new drivers in Truro, especially. Yeah, we've been uh, fortunate in the Maritimes, uh, especially in PEI, to have the uh, matinee racing where some of these younger drivers can uh, get a chance to, uh, you know, get some uh, behind-the-gate action in. And I see Mark Campbell's son even is... Uh, yeah, on the horizon there, land, and so we might see. Yeah, I'm sure if he picks up half of what his father's talent is, he'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I know. And now the matinee circuit is good because I mean, it's hard when you're starting out. I mean, qualifying is a lot different from racing. You get to qualifying, someone opens up the hole for you, but when racing starts, that's all gone. So, I mean, yeah. when they're racing in the matinee, it's closer to racing than qualifying would be. So it's good to get that experience before you're just thrown right to the wolves. Oh yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. I know for like myself, I, uh, I just, I jumped into the amateur racing here for yes, you know, a couple years now. And I remember telling Andy, I'm going in the amateur race. I'm going to do this. And he's just like, with what horse? <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I said, well, Yours. with Prince Adam. <laughs> And yeah. he said, you have not even jogged him. You, you know, you don't do anything. So I really started backwards into that part. I jumped in and I remember going up to the track and the horse is well known for rearing and well known for, you know, wheeling off the track. And what did he do? As soon as we post parade it, he <laughs> reared up and everyone's like, get off. And I was like, I'm <laughs> doing this. I am doing, I'm proving that I can do this. And I was with, Oh, my dear. I think it was Sarah Bruce and Gregory. And it was like, cool. I got a four forty five claimer with me and everyone else got top class horses, but I'm still <laughs> getting around this track. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I totally get it. Like it's it's a whole different atmosphere from training, which I've trained to getting out behind the gate and being on that gate is like it's like the best thing ever. So it's like, we need those young drivers to get, you know, that chance to be behind the gate. So yeah, get them the itch. And I mean, once you start, it's hard to get away from, right? So you can get the itch to them, you're, hopefully you can hook them. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know, well, I know a lot of kids are getting hooked on, uh, you know, even the mini racing and getting in their uh, blood to drive at a very young age. So I think that's yeah, been it's certainly good to get them started at that age because it keeps their interest right. I mean, then they start grooming and then they're still around. They start training. I mean, you got to start somewhere. It's good to have that opportunity to, to start. No, absolutely. Well, that brings us up to uh, another episode of Behind the Gate with uh, Scott and Kate. And again, we'd like to thank uh, Paul Angel, our special guest tonight. Uh, Paul, we thank you very much for your pers perspectives on a lot of uh, questions that we threw at you tonight. And you did a fabulous job, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I uh, want to wish you the best of luck for uh, the upcoming season. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing your two-year-olds in action, as well as uh, seeing Batter Up and uh, Malignity, and then uh, some of your uh, three-year-olds from uh, last year as well. Yes, I'm definitely getting more excited now that we're starting to train and you get the itch to get racing. <laughs> Perfect.
And again, thanks very much. And uh, just a reminder to viewers that we are having a special pop-up edition of the podcast this week. We'll have special guest Monica Sutherland on tap, and she'll uh, be on to tell us about her experience in the Meadowlands this past Saturday night where she took part in International Women's Day. So again, thank you for uh, watching and uh, thank you, Caitlin, again, for putting this all together. It's been uh, fabulous and we look forward to our next episode. Thank you.